Welcome to the Designing Hollywood podcast in association with The John Campia Show. I am your host, Robert Meyer Burnett. Today's episode is sponsored by International Silks and Woolens Fabric Store. Today's guest is an Emmy Award-winning film and television costume designer based in Toronto, Canada. Born of Japanese and Scottish heritage, she combines a passion for authentic storytelling with a lifelong love of fashion and textiles. Her authentic and character-driven approach has made her work in demand with creative and cutting-edge projects. Her costume design credits include the upcoming Gen V, The Boys spin-off, What We Do in the Shadows seasons three, four, and five, Spiral from the Book of Saw, Small Town Murder Songs, which was an official selection of the Toronto International Film Festival in 2010, When Moses Woke, which is a Gemini Award winner for Best Direction in a Performing Arts Program, and Cooper's Christmas, another TIFF official selection, this time from 2008. She's won one Primetime Emmy and has been nominated for three Costume Designers Guild Awards. She holds an honors degree in French Literature and European History from the University of Toronto. So without further ado, please welcome costume designer Laura Montgomery to the Designing Hollywood Show. Laura, it is great to see you. Welcome. Hi. It's an honor to be your guest. <laughs> well, you know, let me ask you, I always start um, these and, and, and ask, when you were growing up, were you a fan of, of movies and television? Was costume design something that you always wanted to get into? When I was growing up, we definitely consumed, we were, very, we were a very TV household, um, so we consumed a lot of television, the TV was always on, uh, we were a family who went to the movies a lot, so we watched a lot of movies. Um, my sister has a PhD now and she works in film and television, radio and television art, so she's a film professor. Wow. Uh, and I was always very interested in costumes and clothing and fashion. I would dress myself up. I would make the two of us dress up and do, you know, kind of costume role play. Anne of Green Gables was a big inspiration for me. Wow. So okay. I would make us like put on a whole bunch of skirts and try to get the silhouette. And we'd have tea parties. I was doing sketches that I thought were fashion sketches, but in hindsight, like they were actually costume sketches because there was always a story. There was like a backstory and an activity and there was a whole, you know, thing. It was a character. It was character design, really. Um, but I didn't, even though we watched a lot of stuff, I didn't know that it was a career or that it was, I just didn't see a path to that. So I always thought of it as a hobby, a side interest. Even in high school, I was, you know, sewing clothes, taking sewing classes, still hobby interest. Um, I thought very briefly about going into fashion, but then I worked a little bit in retail and I didn't love the retail side of it. I thought, you know, I, I just didn't love the idea of designing to sell clothing. It was more about, it was always more about storytelling for me. Mm. And so I just went ahead and, I mean, I kind of giggle when you, read my degree in French and <laughs> French Well, I was going to say, you know, that's we don't see that very often, but okay. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that is, so, you know, I have a Bachelor of Arts degree and I still was just doing it on the side. In university, I took a stage and costume design class. I was doing all the plays at university and still, like, I think it just still didn't occur to me. <laughs> and also, I think it was a little bit of not knowing that it was a career path. And I think being a little bit afraid, too, of how um, kind of the insecurity, the job insecurity and, you know, the stigma against working in the arts and will it be financially lucrative? Will you have a steady job? Um, and it wasn't until, I think, after graduating from university, I was still... I started working in short films and music videos and it became more of a regular gig and I realized and as I met more people and networked a bit more I realized like oh wait a minute like there is a career in this um, so I ended up going back to school to study kind of like a, a film 101 program so wow. we were and that was really fun we were like running around the city shooting on bolexes you kind of learn the technology from back to front you yeah. start on you know you do your super eights and then we did the like the manual editing splicing the footage together at that time it was final cut so we learned final cut um and so that gave me more of a a background and then it was just you know i think work begat work and 
here we are. So in hindsight, it's like, yes, I always wanted to do this. And I guess I did. Um, I just didn't know that I could and I didn't know how to get here. Now, with with a, a, a French literature background, were you also just as interested in art? Because a lot of the costume designers I've talked to, obviously museums and especially when you're doing period pieces, looking at the lighting and the textures of of paintings from three, four hundred years ago becomes sort of an essential uh, necessary thing. Was was that something also that you delved into academically? Was more art it history? It definitely was. Yeah, and I think in hindsight now having a liberal arts education is really helpful because while I was doing that degree, you had to take a lot of kind of elective courses. So I studied Renaissance art and architecture, mm. um, and I have a lot of great books from that period. So I can, you know, I'll recall a specific painting or, um, you know, even a combination of colors, learning about Greek mythology. I find all of that just kind of informs the process when I'm thinking of a character and where I can draw inspiration from. It also just really helps to learn how to research. Not that I, I mean, one of my big regrets from school is that I did not have a good work ethic, <laughs> uh, but I had to learn that through work. Um, and also learning how to write because it was a lot of essay writing. And even now we do a lot of writing like you know i'm writing up little pitches for the designs i'm writing a lot of emails you know asking for crew overtime or <laughs> defending why we need this <laughs> this extra bit in our budget it's actually a lot of writing interesting well when you started in the industry like you said uh, music videos and and short films and things like that did you were you mostly buying things off the rack or were you designing your own clothes with your sewing background? Did you, was that always part of your process? Building things? It was always part of the process. Yeah. Um, and it just started very, very, um, I, you know, very independently. I remember doing music videos, you know, when they had no money, there were these, I don't think it happens anymore. It was called a Bravo fact in Canada. Um, where you could apply to the government. They had this, I think it was like a, a, I don't know if it was a channel, but it was a thing called Bravo where they would air short films and music videos. So you could apply for a Bravo fact grant. And you yeah, we had that. We had, we had Bravo on. here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so you get a little bit of money. Um, and so I remember, yes, yeah, sourcing, but also making and then really being a team of one. So there was one music video and I remember I was on set all day and then at home at my apartment sewing all night because I had to, it was like a fashion show and <laughs> the girls were all going to be in these burlap stacks basically, but they had to look like dresses. So I was like frantically sewing these dresses all night and then bringing them to set the next day because, you know, no one had any money. but. At the time, it was kind of like we were all just doing it because we wanted to work in film and we were liking to being creative. And so it kind of felt like everyone was in the same boat. Uh, but to answer your question, yes, it was also a lot of fun. I don't do a lot of sewing personally anymore. I'm actually not very good at it. They're, the people who really do it well are much better at it. Um, but I did start off doing a lot of my own sewing and pattern making. Now, what's, you know, a lot of, obviously, a lot of American television is made in Canada. And Canada has, the government, I think, is a, much more friendly in terms of uh, fostering that uh, the work. I mean, it's hard to find, like, in my home state of Washington, it was always very difficult to find. There was no state cooperation with film, which is why when you shoot Seattle, you go to Vancouver instead, <laughs> which is fine. You just had northern experience closure yeah that's that was it was that was about and, and a little maybe a little twin peaks but um yeah i love northern exposure it was great i loved it, it was a great show um god that's a, that's one i haven't seen that in forever good, good nice to go back and revisit that so when you were getting involved into tv and into film what was the transition like for you going from short films and music videos to becoming more professional in terms of larger scale projects was that a hard transition for you to make? I wouldn't 
say that it was particularly difficult. I think as my career was growing, also the industry in Toronto was growing. Mm. I think what happened was because, as you mentioned, Canada offered a lot of tax credits. They still do. I think, you know, productions really save money by shooting in Canada. I was in one production meeting and someone said, like, you know, why are we shooting this year? And a producer kind of offhandedly said, uh, because we saved $3 million. <laughs> so it still exists. I think that now other places, especially in the States, I think places like Georgia and New Orleans are offering much better tax incentives. But now, because so much has happened in Toronto, we've built up this really strong infrastructure. So we have experienced crews. We have equipment rentals. We have studio space. And it's a city that people like to come to, like their restaurants and their things to do. So it's really well equipped. Now, even if we don't offer the best tax credits anymore, we you can come here and you can make, you know, an Oscar-winning movie. You can make a Star Trek. Um, so for me, it... It's just kind of a slow process of networking. It, it's so funny because you look back at it, and I guess with rose-colored glasses, it seems like, oh, yes, it just happened. But I do, I remember at the time feeling, you know, very stressed about it and talking with other people. Getting into the union was very difficult. I think they purposely make it very challenging. There's a bit of attrition there of, like, you know, they're trying to weed out the people who aren't serious. Um, so the requirements to get into the union are very stringent and, I remember, you know, being at pubs with other friends and, you know, talking about we have to have our pagers on all the time because if we miss that union call, then they might never call us again and <laughs> we'll be on their blacklist. Um, but, you know, it was like so stressful <laughs> because not everyone had cell phones at the time. Um, but we, <laughs> we had our pagers. <laughs> and for me, it was, I think, just through luck and through work, <laughs> I know, I met people who I met other costume designers and other people in the industry who were working. Um, I was very lucky that I wasn't working on the bigger production. SARS hit Toronto very hard. And at the time that SARS was happening, I was still in the independent world, and which was not quite as affected. So I was able to weather SARS pretty well because I was still in the short film world. And then once SARS was over, yeah, I just had made connections through, um, there's an organization in Canada called CAFTCAD, the Canadian Alliance of Film and Television Costume Arts and Design. So I networked through that organization, met some fellow costumers. I met Antoinette Massam, who is a Canadian who now lives in LA. Um, I went out to the West Coast to do a, an MOW with her that was shooting in Victoria. And then um, just kind of continue to work and build contacts, but it did seem it did seem challenging. Now that I have been a union member for a long time, it feels like oh yeah, but <laughs> I remember it being hard at the beginning. Well, I really kind of like you, you did a lot of different kinds of projects. I mean, I uh, you you worked on a horror film that I saw, I want to say a while ago called The Shrine, which which uh, the when they go to like the in, they're in Europe and Poland or something. And uh, it, it starts out kind of slow, but it definitely has a great a great ending. But then you, you you worked on a lot of different kinds of material. You didn't like just specialize in one thing. And I wonder if you could talk about that and, and, and what is your approach? How do you begin a project? Does it begin with the script for you? Do you talk to the director? Um, how do you jump in? It definitely begins with the script. And I think I'm glad that you think that my work has been buried I try to keep it that way because I think no one wants to get pigeonholed like the reason why we're so attracted to film is that it's always different right. so I'm always looking for a new challenge it definitely be, it all begins with the script um, and then and then I do like to talk to the director afterwards to see because you know you'll have your interpretation of it but I want to get into their head to see what they're thinking and then from there, it, depend, it really depends on the material where you go for research. Is it, uh, is it historical? Is it contemporary? Is it science fiction? And just try to use, you know, am I on the internet? Am I on the library? Am I just walking around on the street looking at people? A lot of times I'm doing, I find I do research from my own memory too. 
if there's a person like there'll be a person that i remember and i try to catalog people too right <laughs> like if i see someone with a really interesting look i'll just file that away um and then use it later <laughs> <laughs> and now what about actors when you know obviously you that's sort of the end of the process I, i've always said that um, one of the most important things on any production is you've got to make sure your hair and makeup people are great and your costume designer is great because that's your as a producer that's your big line of defense making sure your your talent has to know they look good when they go out on the, on the set so they don't they don't have to think about it so when they look they know they look good they can concentrate on their character and performance what's your relationship like with actors and and how do you how do you sort of build that rapport and um uh, how does that work for you it's, uh, my relationship with the actors is I try as much as possible to have it be very close and very collaborative. Um, I really, because I know that as much as, and I often will have had more time with the material, so I will have had a lot of time and a lot of conversations, and I know what the director is thinking, and I know what I'm thinking, but then the actor will have done their own research and they have their own approach to the character so i love having an initial conversation with them of saying you know this is what this is the information i've been given this is what i think what are your initial thoughts what are you like what's important to you what are you feeling for this character nowadays there is but i'm conscious of the fact that you're dressing a body and there is a the actor's comfort level with what they're wearing i really love it when the actor can put themselves to the side and just focus on the character uh, because some actors don't like to wear things because they personally don't like to wear them right but if it's right for the character then it's right for the character i saw i was at the academy museum and i actually recorded a video of ann ross saying uh you know about an actor something like you don't like yellow? I don't care if you like yellow. Your character loves yellow. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, once, you know, when I am at that level, I'll be able to say that. <laughs> uh, but right now, but there is a certain sensitivity because, you know, they are putting themselves out there. So I want to make them feel as comfortable as possible and as confident as possible and just do whatever we can to get them feeling, to help bring this character to life. And it, it like, both of us do it. Yeah, no, I, I would think that, and that's probably fun for you as a designer too, when you see a, an actor bring to life your design work. Well, to sort of follow up on that, what is your relationship with obviously a cinematographer and a production designer, and do you like to coordinate in advance to find out what the overall color palette's going to be, and do you tend to design to make sure that your designs kind of work within the overall scope of the film, or do you feel that you're kind of doing your own thing? We absolutely have to work with the production designer and the cinematographer um, because otherwise it just it wouldn't be cohesive the actors live in that environment it happened to me actually on spiral where usually i like to see i like to see the location photos i like to see what the sets are going to look like if they're renderings or if i can actually walk the set i love to do that if i can take you know if i'm thinking of a fabric and i'm deciding which fabric to choose from if i can camera test it or if i can walk it onto the set and photograph it on the set to see which one because it can be so different under the lighting and in the environment on spiral one of the characters and the blocking ended up that she was kind of standing in front of an open door on a porch um, and the inside of the door was a burnt orange and she was wearing burnt orange and I just thought oh my god <laughs> it's the same <laughs> color as the door inside of the door um, so you never want something like that to happen so yeah I always want to know where where are our characters going to be situated? What will their lighting be? Where will they, you know, what will be their backdrop? What couch, what's the color of the couch they're going to be sitting on? Even I was just in a meeting for a show that I'm working on now, uh, and we're talking about some driving scenes, and I saw my assistant designer write down a note of vehicle color and interior color. Because that's another thing, like, what color is the vehicle interior? <laughs> right. Because <laughs> that can go south really quickly. You know, if I, so, okay, when you're in a situation where, you know, you look at, 
obviously there's a orange doorway and characters wearing do you would you then go to the director and go yo is it too late to switch costumes would you would you ever go up and maybe offer to change the actors or actresses costume or would you not do that is it too far gone it depends on the situation in that particular situation i knew i couldn't change her costume because we were on we were shooting on location so i was like okay they're pressed for time there's no way they're gonna and i don't even want to put myself out there to say can we shuttle her back but I was close with the director, so I kind of pointed it out like, you know, if you, not suggesting that he would want to change the blocking, but just kind of, you know, brought it to his attention. Um, If we're in studio and I can quickly fly in and it's an easy switch and I can just fly in and another shirt that looks a little bit better, a little bit different, that's happened actually where I've just switched out the sweater because once the lighting hit it, it was a little bit too close to the background. if it's possible then we do it if it's not possible then sometimes we just like don't say anything (laughs) well yeah but at least as and spiral that was that was darren bowsman who directed that he came back Mm because he's directed so many i I, i've met darren before he's he's a great guy he's uh i love those i loved spiral i have to say i thought it was really good yeah i i mean chris rock playing a a very unique yeah it was a lot of i mean it was a lot of fun i mean i like that you first of all what we do in the shadows can we just talk about that because uh it what a fantastic show i mean you know it's funny i i really love that film and i figured they're gonna do a tv show of it there's no way the tv show is gonna be as good as the movie but i was wrong i mean that that shows hilarious and the costumes everything about it what's it like to work on 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 that show and tell me you have the best time in your life while you're working on that yeah it's the greatest gift ever and you're not the first person to say that they were really nervous that the tv show wouldn't be good i was also a big fan of the movie so when i heard that the show was coming to toronto i was so excited to get to work on it um because i loved the movie i thought it was really funny i also loved the costuming in the movie and I actually can't think of another show that would be as rich and (laughs) creatively delicious because I I love to do period and I love to do builds and shadows is a ton of building and it's period, but it's many, many periods. Right. So, and then it's also contemporary characters and it's funny so we can be kind of silly with it and so and now that we've kind of like we've really we're in a we're in a good place and everyone kind of knows each other and we can kind of by this point we're getting into the sixth season we have the freedom to kind of suggest things and if there's a character and not a lot of the backstory is on the page like for um david cross's character when he played a vampire he was just supposed to be really really old but it wasn't specified how old he was and so i just and at that point there's a lot of design work on shadows so sometimes when we get towards the end of the season i'm feeling a little bit like my reserves of creativity are getting a bit depleted (laughs) so for him i I think I was, I was driving and I heard Margaret Atwood talking about her late husband's book of birds. And she was talking about a vulture and I thought, oh, a vulture, that's a good image. I'll take that, I'll take those colors of a vulture and then just like, I don't know, the, the kind of grossness of a vulture. And there was a period that we hadn't done and a shape that we hadn't done before. And so I just asked, you know, can we make him, we know he's going to be kind of European. Can we do this period? Because I'd love to do like the little pumpkin pants and that shape of jacket. Can we do like 16th century Spain? Uh, And they were like, sure, go ahead. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's very cool. I mean, that's got to be gratifying for you too in that situation where you get to bring more than just you you pulled something out of your own headspace and were able to convey it on, on camera. I mean... That has to be incredibly gratifying. Do you get to do a lot? I mean, in your in your line of work, do you get to do that more often than say audiences might think, or is that is that a rare luxury when you get to, you know, take Margaret Atwood's talk and turn it into something? 
I would say that it can be a rare luxury, especially okay. when you can do it so overtly. Mm. I think we always try to have, you know, you always have to have a backstory and you have a subtle inspiration, but on some shows, you know, they really want what they want and you really have to color in the lines. Um, and so, yeah, Shadows is a real gift because we have more freedom than I think I've had on any, especially on like a studio or like a network show. Uh, we really we get a lot of creative freedom. Yeah, I can imagine. I mean, and, and it shows. I mean, it's 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 on. It's definitely on the screen. Um, now, another show you worked on, like I don't think there's a more bonkers show on TV than The Boys, and it was inevitable that they're gonna they were gonna do a spinoff, and um, I can only imagine <laughs> with with the precedent that The Boys sets, like. What was it like to work on 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 a Gen V, and uh, uh, did you get to design? I mean, it seems like it's a rite of passage to design superhero costumes, but these are characters that aren't yet; they haven't joined the Seven yet. They're going to school, but did you get to delve into that? And and what was it like working on that show? I mean, yeah, the boys' universe is so wild and wacky. Um, I don't know if I can say this, but just like on the boys. There are a lot of dicks, <laughs> so be prepared for that. <laughs> wow, uh, I, 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 you know I have to say that that uh, in was it the last season, season three, where it opens mm -hmm. where a character walks into one. Yep. Oh yeah. <laughs> There's, they just kind of take that to the next level on Gen V. <laughs> well, I can't even. I don't even. I, I can't even imagine what that is. I know. Wow. <laughs> You'll have to watch it. Yeah, they're not they're not shy about that. Um I did not unfortunately I did not get to do any super suits. So on the boys and even on Gen V, so on Gen V there are just no super suits because right. they were just not um in the in the first season. And on the boys, so Laura Jean Shannon and her team do all the super suits for the most part. I think some are done locally, Michael Ground. Uh, we'll design some of them, but for, you know, your Homelander and Soldier Boy, right. the Deep, all of those are done in her shop. So when, because I think Gen V, there was a bit of a stop start to it. So initially she had designed some really cool super suits for the cast that I think you might see season two. They haven't started shooting season two yet. Um, but for us, it was, it kind of it got very watered down. <laughs> we were going to have some sort of kind of like, uh led like kind of performance fighting uh <laughs> super suit kind of which eventually just became like a gym uniform right <laughs> so i ended up sort of designing you know a, a, a technical gym uniform <laughs> and that was cool and i tried to you know look at what she does with the with the lines of the clothing and looking at the sportswear but instead the approach that i took which was is still kind of creating a superhero but without a super suit was to try to think of an iconic look for all the characters so the guiding the principle was kind of what's the comic-con and even we do that in shadows too so that's something that harvey is like oh what is you know this is this would be great for comic-con um so for the boys characters it was thinking of you know what is the one iconic look that we can put them in that will be like that's the look that people identify them in in their street clothes so for the lead character of marie we designed this long um kind of 70s meets 90s burgundy leather trench coat that was her kind of her signature piece i noticed that in the boys a lot of the cast have signature jackets butcher always has his black coat with the tape on the back right Huey has his jacket with the kind of the bowling stripes down it. So I wanted to pull that idea of signature jacket and use it on Gen V as well. So a few of the characters have a signature jacket um, that I hoped would help identify them and really solidify a character for them. Nice. Yeah, I'm looking. I mean, I, I can't wait to see the show. I, uh, I, they, they released a new promo for uh, the new season of The Boys. And it just I'm like, yeah, we're going to get two shows this season so i'm very excited about that um is was there ever a mandate did did anyone ever tell you on that show yeah 
push it even further, become even more outrageous, because there's stuff that happens on that show that I haven't seen in any movie or TV show ever before. Uh, it's amazing how far you guys go. And, and the show is, is, is bananas. Both the, the boys and I would assume Gen V is. So was there ever a mandate? Did people go to you and go, hey, you can go even further with this? push this even further you know if you had something outrageous to go even more outrageous and what what might be the most outrageous thing that you you created for gen v can you tell us or not maybe you can't i don't think there wasn't they really didn't want to be outrageous with the clothes i think they wanted and this is what helps i think sell both shows is that it, you believe that it could be living in the real world. So right. they really wanted everyone to look like real kids. Like this is just, this is the world. This is a regular university. The kids just happen to have superpowers. So nothing to distract from all the other crazy stuff that's happening. They really right. wanted it to feel like a kid that you would see at, you know, at any college. Um, for us, the fun thing were designing around their superpowers. So there's one character actually not sure how much I can say. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, without spoiling anything, um, maybe not get specific, but it, I, I think it's interesting designing around someone's powers just as a general, you know, because you have to, if somebody's, like, athletic, you have to make sure that their costume works so they can move in it. I mean, it was interesting with Michael Keaton coming back playing Batman. I remember in 89 when his the first Tim Burton Batman movie came out you know the Batman's cowl couldn't move he, you know he couldn't turn his head and you you would have thought that that might have been something they would have dealt with but they didn't really and it was always sort of strange and then when he took his cowl off it always had to rip off so he had to keep making them it was but now they've really kind of superhero costumes are down there's they're an art form now that have been so refined but when you're working on that what do you do in instances like that when you have to sort of designed to the power or designed to the ability is that hard to do i wouldn't say that it's hard to do but you do have to keep it in mind from the very inception of mm. the costume so if you know that there's going to be something that they have to do um then you have to you have to start with that so for example for marie um, I think I'm not giving anything away. I think you see it in the trailer. She has a blood power. And so it was a choice to make her trench coat kind of a burgundy leather so that assuming there would be blood stains, we're not showing them too much. Right. Um, for the character of Jordan, who's played by two actors as the same person, it was designing a garment that would look like a similar shape and, and look work on two different bodies but looking like the same body so playing with the scale a little bit and making one actually actually i think that the female jordan's jacket is actually a bit bigger they didn't want to overemphasize it but just to make it obvious that their body grows when they become male jordan so just tweaking the sizes a bit like making the sleeves a little bit longer right sure that's cool I mean, I, I look, I'm looking forward to the, for the show. Uh, and I have to say, in addition to that, you worked on, and I saw the trailer for this, but you worked on the new Matlock TV series with Kathy Bates, Oscar winner Kathy Bates. And I have to say, the trailer looked pretty good. Like, she, she, she looks like she's great in it. And is this, is this a pseudo-sequel, or is it a continuation? Is this Matlock's daughter? Like what is what is the premise of this show, or is it all all new? Okay, I I cannot say enough good things about this show. I think that you will love it. You will watch it. It looks well. The trailer um, looks. She looks so good in it. I mean, she's great in anything. But it, I really like the idea behind it. You know, for those of you who don't yeah, know or you haven't seen the trailer, really... Kathy Bates is the new Matlock. She comes back as a as her own age to a, a law firm and becomes an, a lawyer, and she's the oldest lawyer in the firm, yet she's new. And it, it, it just looks it looks delightful, and it's Kathy Bates. I can't wait. It's so clever. Like, they use all of her strength, her folksiness, but then also her grit, 
the show is not really a sequel. It's kind of, it's very meta. So in the world of the show, Matlock, the TV show exists and they're aware of it. Like <laughs> it, it was a show. <laughs> And so she is no relation or um, affiliation, but it's kind of like, it's a legal procedural, but then there's a twist at the end. I would have watched it even without the twist, but then the twist, you're like, oh my gosh. Like it just, it got real all of a sudden. Um, and it's just, she's also kind of a superhero because as you mentioned, she's an older woman and she is using that as her superpower. So she uses to her advantage the fact that, as she says in the script, everyone overlooks an older woman. Nobody right. notices me. So she can fly under the radar and get stuff done because she's like, nobody's paying attention to me, which I thought was a great commentary. I love that it had a female lead and just a great commentary on the fact that it's true. Women in general, your value is determined by your age and your look. And when you don't have that, I think society, even though obviously women of any age have value beyond what they look like. Um, it was a great commentary on, on that. So when you were going into that, knowing you were going to address Kathy Bates, how did you approach, like, what did you do specifically for her character, knowing that that was her philosophy? And, and did that translate the idea that a woman's an older woman's superpowers people don't notice or how did you make that work that that idea work with your costumes yeah so i i mean it was quite terrifying <laughs> but she is so nice and so kind and so generous but um i was you know very very terrified initially uh i spoke to some fellow i spoke to another designer friend of mine louis sakara who had done a movie with her and so I was like, you know, how is she? You know, give me any pointers. What should I do? What should I not do? And with Matlock, she is, I don't want to give too much away, but she's kind of playing a character. So she is supposed to look invisible. But I also wanted, because she is Kathy Bates and because she's the lead also, and she's so beautiful, I wanted to design something that would be, um, that would look kind of generic, actually. It was hmm. intentional that it looked like something that you could go and just purchase off the rack at Macy's. I told a story about, and this is true, My at a church bazaar, my grandmother ended up bringing home the wrong coat from the coat room because all of the ladies had this, it was this navy London fog trench coat and they just all had the same coat pretty much. It was just a coat room full of this coat. And we only knew it wasn't her coat because it was the wrong size. Uh, <laughs> but the point was to design something that would be very flattering on Kathy's body and to really allow her to shine, but to look kind of generic to help her blend in like that coat, like, oh, it's just, you know, a lady in a suit. Right. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's, it had to have been f great to work with her. I, I, I don't think I could get past wanting to say that I was her number one fan and talk about misery all day long, but, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I wouldn't, I would, or, or, or being in Titanic. She's the unsinkable Molly Brown. Um, but, uh, the, it's, I know. uh, yeah, right. I mean, she had great it, stories too. Like you just kind of, you don't want to ask, but then sometimes you would just, it would just happen in conversation and you would get this amazing nugget from, yeah, from Titanic. And, oh my God. <laughs> no, I mean, and you think about it because Kathy Bates is, she's been around for a long time. I mean, she was in Dolores Claiborne, I think. Was she in Dolores with, with Jennifer Jason yeah. Lee? Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, uh, it's kind of a forgotten Stephen King adaptation. People forget that everyone remembers Misery, but Dolores Claiborne is actually quite a great film, and she's great in it. And her her body yeah. work, her career is amazing. And it was when I saw the trailer. Um, you know, I don't watch a lot of network TV because it's a CBS show, and I, I the trailer I was like, I'll watch that. I mean, it looks really it yeah. looks really good and fun, and she looks like she's having a blast in it. So. Yeah, I don't think it will disappoint. And I have to say, like, this woman's stamina, our first day, I think we shot 18 hours. She's in every scene. Um, she killed it. That, yeah, that's great to hear. I mean, she's she's amazing. But again, you know, professional. Uh, and she's worked for James Cameron, so everything after that's easy. <laughs> You know, yeah. once you're in Titanic. She, she did have a good story. She did have a good story about that. <laughs> 
about a hat going into the ocean. <laughs> oh, God. I wonder how many multiples of that hat you needed on a James Cameron movie, like 60. Oh, it was a one-off oh. thrown into the ocean. Oh, no. <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> I can only imagine. So it was a real pleasure to watch her work. Um, every take she delivered something different. There was like a small nuance that she did, and it was just like, it was just watching a master of their craft. It oh. was just watching her act was incredible. As a as a film fan and growing up watching TV as you, as you did, do you ever sometimes get starstruck? Do you ever like, like, oh my God, I'm working with so-and-so from this movie, and this is amazing. Or do you, are you, do you always have that professional demeanor and you, you'll never let on if you're starstruck? I think, I'm trying to think of, I did fangirl in an elevator over Fortune Feimster because I was just very, I was going up to do a fitting and she was at, I think it's, it's a hotel that a lot of actors stay at in Toronto because they do long-term rentals. And she was in our elevator and I was just like, oh, Fortune Feimster, I love you. <laughs> but if I was working with her, I wouldn't have done that. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, I think for me, there's an initial period of nerves um, Sofia Coppola was a big one. I just felt like quite nervous about working with her because I so respect her. She was just an icon. As a teenager, like I love, I looked up to her as, um, you know, someone in fashion, someone as a director. I love her movies. I love her work. And so when she was in Shadows leading up to it, I was nervous. But then usually when they come in, first of all, when they come in, you just have to like be professional and, you know, try to make them feel comfortable that, you know, you also know what you're doing. And so you're in like, have to make them feel like they're in good hands. And then often when, when she came in, for example, she was just so lovely and disarming and um, just very, it was very comfortable just chatting about, and I had to check after she left, we kind of checked ourselves and we were like, okay, that just seemed like a normal chat with a friend, but when she's talking about things like her dad, like I'm in the back of my mind, I'm like, her dad. That's what, you know, I'm talking about my dad, but my dad is Ted Montgomery. Her dad is Francis Coppola. <laughs> um, but usually when it comes down to doing the work, when they arrive in the fitting room, it's like, okay, we're working together. Uh, and then it kind of falls away as soon as you meet in person, usually because the actors are very um are very kind right yeah well that's that's always great to hear and I, i've been a fan of hers i mean I, she was in rumblefish in 1983 she she played diane lane's little sister <laughs> i mean coppola directed that when he when he made the he made the outsiders in rumblefish and i i was a much bigger fan of rumblefish is still a great movie but uh, she's a little kid in that you know and then of course she i love virgin suicides you know her first her debut feature yeah of that and, movie and loss in translation you know uh incredible that's that's cool that you got to you got to work with her it's very emotional evocative work yes yeah no absolutely um and then when she did the beguiled i was surprised that she did the beguiled um yeah i thought that was very very cool um but yeah, yeah she has such a specific point of view right absolutely um, so I guess, you know, uh, to conclude, how would you offer, there's a lot of people that, that are interested in getting into this profession. What are some of the suggestions that you might offer or provide to people that want to follow in your footsteps? I would discourage them. No. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would say networking is really important um, and then working a lot of different positions within the costume department. I think, you know, a lot of people come in and they're like, I want to be a designer, which is great. But then, and some people end up continuing on that path and then other people I find, you know, they think that and then they start working in breakdown and they realize like, oh, I have a passion for textile art. I find as a designer, having worked a lot of different jobs makes me a better designer because I know what I'm asking for. 
you know, even if I wasn't the best sewer or cutter, I kind I have an idea of how to construct clothing and I kind of know what like what to ask for is it possible is it doable um having onset experience is really valuable just to know you know it's one thing to have a costume look great in a fitting but how is it going to behave on set is this a scarf that's going to switch um size or be really finicky and then in the editing all of a sudden all you're noticing is this scarf going um and that was part of I mean I think you touched on it before but I've done a lot of different things and when I first got into the union and working on bigger shows I tried to work as many different jobs as I could just to see because I'd only had experience with smaller shows I wanted to know okay what is a costume department like working on Suicide Squad I just wanted to get in there and be like what does it look like to have 40 people working on this one movie right. in costumes like you're getting fabric designed in house, milled in Italy, flown in. Like, what are the machinations of a department of that size? Um, and so, and through that, you know, you're meeting people, you're networking. So, I would say networking and just doing as many different things as possible, and and then it all it will all help with the with becoming a better designer. Now, what about kind of uh, academic background? Uh, do you think everybody should have a degree in French literature? Or should you go, you know, because like you said, I mean, I, I, I don't mean that facetiously because you said that that has served you well. Because um, uh, I've, I've heard people tell me, learn as much as you can. You know, learn about everything. Be a fan of art, be a fan of literature, be a fan of film, but be a fan of, of color as well and, and textiles and all kinds of things. I think that a degree in French literature should be a requirement um, I think it should be in the union test now. No. <laughs> um, you know what? It definitely has helped me. I think that learning how to research and just knowing more about a variety of subjects, I don't want to, and you can get this in a lot of different ways. Like I know not everyone, especially in film, not everyone in film is suited to school. Um, but if you can, you know, just read a lot because often a script will land on your desk and it's great to understand the references in the script, even if they're contemporary or if they're historical and being able to converse with your writers and your directors and kind of understand what they're talking about because they've read a lot, they've studied a lot. Um, you don't have to know everything that they're talking about, but it's helpful if you kind of have an idea and if you can bring your own thoughts to the table and offer your own you know if you even if you can travel and look at different things and then kind of file it away like oh the medieval textile that you saw if there was a weaving technique that maybe five years down the road you want to use those colors or that weaving or something but the texture the patina of that and translate it somewhere it all like it all helps yeah no absolutely um well, now, let me ask you this. Do you have a presence on social media? Or can people go to your Instagram and see your work? Or is there a place people can... Do you have a website? I have a website. Um, it's updated-ish. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then I'm not very good at Instagram. I do have an Instagram. Um, so I would definitely encourage people to check out Laura Montgomery Design on Instagram. I kind of vacillate between it's either pictures of my children or if there's something exciting happening at work, it's a lot of pictures of work. <laughs> <laughs> and I try to be a better Instagrammer, but it's hard. It actually is like, it, that's kind of a job. Right. It, no, it absolutely is. It absolutely is. Um, is it just lauramontgomery.com? It's Laura Montgomery Design uh, is my Instagram. Oh, very cool. All right. Well, now everybody can, can follow you there. Well, listen, this has been just delightful speaking with you. And um, we've got Generation V is coming out, right? Is it Gen? That's what it is, Generation V? Yeah, Gen V. Gen V. Gen V is coming out. And then we've got Matlock is coming out. And i um, really looking forward to following more of your work. And I want to thank you for being a great guest here on the Designing Hollywood Show. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to chat with you. Oh, it's been so much fun. And thanks very much.
And a very special thanks to our sponsor, International Silks and Woolens. ISW has what you need. Over 14,000 square feet of fabrics, notions, and drapery. Their large selection of over 100,000 fabrics includes theatrical, woolens, notions, bridal, cotton, drapery, and designer. ISW is eminent for the theatrical department, which is considered to be the largest in the United States. Whether you're looking for the perfect material for a special occasion or vintage material for a big budget Hollywood movie, you will find it here at International Silks and Woolens. A special thank you to founder and executive producer Martika Ibarra, co-founder, costume designer, the legendary Marilyn Vance, and of course, John Campia from The John Campia Show. Thank you to all of our viewers for tuning in and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Tune in to the audio version wherever you listen to podcasts. I am, of course, your host, Robert Meyer Burnett, and you can find me on Instagram at rmburnett or find me on Twitter at burnettrm or on YouTube at postgeeksingularity. Thanks very much. Like, subscribe, and give us your comments. What would you like to see on the channel? Right down below. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you on the next episode of Designing Hollywood.